There's no problem. It's, uh, it's, it's been a long day so far. I can't imagine how you all are holding up, but, uh, you know, everybody that's been on has been really engaging. Uh, I loved hearing from everybody, you know, Carl, Wolf, and Sergey, and uh, Rick, and Craig. I mean, it's just, you just had an amazing uh, speakers and presentations today. What is it like to be Jack Hare's son? And <laughs> how do you make that right with yourself? Because my it's father was who he was, there's a lot of folks who believe that because they knew him or loved him, that uh, that his memory, name, and likeness belong to them, and that makes it really difficult for 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 me and my family uh, to to grasp and use, um, you know, his name and his influence and the potential uh, returns that that has in order to keep so many of the things that need to be done uh, going. Uh, like educating folks, like, you know, uh, you know, going to Birmingham and, and speaking uh, and where, where people like are shocked to hear. The strain. Your dad is you know? the spark of revolution. I'm honored to, to speak to you and also know what your position is, because we all have these different roles in this crazy thing, you know, yeah. and, and you know, you talking about how people kind of don't understand what your dad did or they think it's, that, it was a lead thing, you know, yeah. not a global thing. Yeah, but, but that, that's also um, a product of the environment over the last 25 years. You know, when my father uh, became an activist uh, in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, when he started educating himself, uh, it was about activism. It wasn't necessarily about being an advocate. It was about fighting for the wrongs of uh, imprisoning somebody for this plant. Um, and, and it was a much different time. And as he started to educate himself and compile this information and work with so many people that contributed to this book, uh, you know, uh, both in time, energy, and 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 information. Um, when this book was published, you know there was still no legal cannabis. There was still, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, we we literally went through a time in the 1970s where our own government under uh, under Nixon uh, was spraying a, a substance called Paraquat on cannabis because American citizens would smoke it and potentially die. And they wouldn't have to worry about them anymore, either voting or protest. People stopped learning. It was just like, okay, we won. And they stopped fighting in many ways, at least at the same levels. They stopped fighting and they stopped understanding how important this plant really was. And, and you know, even in the 70s, when my father was talking to the people at Normal uh, uh, about, you know, you know, it, I, you know, he understood that people were being imprisoned for for cannabis, uh, uh, and, and they shouldn't be because this plant wasn't what they said it was, you know. But even even the folks at Normal, uh, the National Organization to Reform Marijuana Laws, were uh, they were like, Jack, you're bad for cannabis because you, you know the things that you're saying that hemp is going to save the world and that you can make fifty thousand things from it, and you know books and Bibles and maps and like, they're like, who cares? People are going to jail and we need to get them out and, or we need to, you know, we need to defend them. And, and it didn't fit in with their narrative. And because my father was saying that this plant, which was at that time, uh, ten, you know, basically unproven, but cer certainly theorized that it could save the world. And he was like at the top of his lungs, no, hemp is going to save the world. They literally shunned him. And they pushed him away from, from inside cannabis. And they're like, Jack, you're bad for this. And it took years after the book went out uh, that they started realizing that, you know what? This book that he wrote and the information that he's been talking about for 15, 20 years is mm -hmm. real. And, and it's not only is it real, it, it, will need to, it will need to happen. It will need to be embraced. It will need to... Uh, be a part of our everyday existence if we want to have an existence. And, and that's when people started 
you know, uh, you know, people started, you know, opening up uh, hemp shops, you know, the body shop in, in, in California and the different uh, topicals and bath, you know, salts and whatever else that was starting to be used, you know, the clothing, the backpacks from Hempstead, uh, you know, the, you know, different foods, um, you know, things started to come up, but it was always seemed as, oh, well, that's super hippy dippy. You know, that's too much. And, and, as long, and, and it wasn't very profitable. So not a lot of people were flocking to it. And, you know, because, you know, if you couldn't make a hundred bucks off of something, you know, or if you couldn't, you know, if you couldn't double or triple or quadruple your money, that wasn't really worth it. So why are we dealing with hemp? And, and, and it finally got to this critical point, this critical mass of, of we better do something. And the one thing that we know because of the things that people on your show today have talked about is that by embracing this plant, you have the ability to change how we live on this planet, how to, how to, how to not just survive uh, in the future, but to thrive in it. And if you embrace this plant to its full utility, if you, if, if you take it to heart, if you do the things that you can every day uh, to improve your fellow human beings' life, that you should do it. And that book is still the most important reading information that anybody listening today on this should read. It is the, it is the catalyst for the future. You know, growing up with, uh, with hemp and cannabis information, uh, it, it's just uh, extraordinarily uh, humbling to see it all being uh, used in a way that it was thought to have been able to be used and now actually uh, being put into uh, uh, practice uh, through all of these different technologies. Uh, it's, it's, an extraordinary, uh, it's an extraordinary day for cannabis and hemp uh, and all the things that it touches and will continue to touch. And I am so honored once again to have you and thank you for talking about what you're doing and, and we're all a part of a very big yet very small community and anything that you that you need we are here and thank you for joining us today this is amazing well thank you all so much thank you Aaron uh thank you Ramon uh, for inviting me, uh, to be a part of this. Um, you know, uh, I'm really, uh, as I sat here today, I'm really, I'm really humbled by all the things that you all do. You all are amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank You're you. not supposed to let me cry when I'm doing interviews and stuff. You're not supposed to let me do that. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you. And I really feel like, you know, being a part of this community and seeing what people do with this plant, it's more like for you and, and hearing about your story, it is less about the plant and more about what people did with it right? It yeah. was our first tool. It was our first canvas. It was our first paper. It was our first paint. Like how could humans not exist without <laughs> it? Yeah. Uh, they you could, know? I mean, I mean, they probably could because we're resourceful, but yeah, the, but the, 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 the part of being resourceful, be the part of being <laughs> resourceful is understanding what a resource is and how to use that resource to its full utility. And mm -hmm. in the past, we did that. In the future, we need to do that. That is a great, that's actually the perfect point to end on right there. Thank you.